Hey guys, Coach here. Hey, thanks for giving me a week off. I appreciate it. During that week, I ended up demolishing part of my garage, taking things apart and getting ready for some construction. This week, I want to let you know something up front. This is a short version of Irrigation 101. This is going to be a little longer one here on the podcast. I can't teach this in a really short, down and dirty 15 minutes. I just can't. In the video on YouTube, it will be a, a little longer too. I just don't feel like I'm given enough information if I shorten it up for the trolls that need the answer right away. I just, I can't do it. Sorry. It's going to be complete or it's not going to be plain and simple. So this week we're talking about irrigation. We're talking about uh, doing it yourself. We're talking about the little roadmap or at least some of the knowledge behind a successful irrigation system that you can do yourself. You just have to follow it along and you have to understand it a little bit. So I suggest that you uh, take notes if you'd like. I suggest that you uh, watch more than once and then go out and compare what you're learning to the situation that you have. So there's going to be a few basics. There's a, a little bit of math. Not much, but a, a skosh, but it's very easy to uh, understand. And you're going to understand hydraulics just a little bit, but it won't be complicated either. A few basics that will lead to a successful outcome and as a result, a successful project. Are you ready? Let's get this thing underway. Hey friends, Maestro here. Just dropping a reminder to check out the podcast description for discount opportunities and any important links. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on a specific app, please don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps us grow and continue to provide these free podcasts. So first of all, I do realize that everybody who listens here does not need an irrigation system. Maybe you live in the part of the world that gets annual rainfall that doesn't need to have irrigation because mother nature does the watering for you. And to those folks, congratulations. I happen to be one of them up here in Maine where uh, for the most part, we get enough rainfall that uh, I don't want to put in a big elaborate irrigation system. But for those who do, everyone, uh, in this day and age, there are times where even your regular summer rains, spring and summer and fall rains, will uh, let you down sometimes. And then what are you going to do? Then you're a hose dragger. And although that is not a, a prison sentence, it can be kind of time consuming and it is rather antiquated. So people put in irrigation systems, if for nothing else, as an insurance policy against a temporary drought. And I have seen droughts strike in places that normally everything is always wet. The upper Midwest, the Southeast, and yes, even the areas that I'm in. But I come from the West where, yeah, droughts and hot summer temps and very erratic and inconsistent rains. And for the most part, thunderstorms in the summertime. But where I was in the Central Valley... Now, Mother Nature turned off the tap sometimes as early as April. You get a little, maybe a little bit in May, but not anything. And then you're done. You're done for most of May, June, July, August, September, even October, even November before the rains return. And if you didn't have an irrigation system of some kind, it was very, very hard to have a nice landscape, especially one that, although I'm not a fan too much anymore, especially one that has lawn as a dominant part of the landscape. So in this case, here we go. Here we go. We are going to start out with step one right out of the gate. We are going to determine what you have. I'm not going to say we. You are going to determine what you have and what you will be irrigating. If it's the whole landscape and you have a brand new yard or one that you are renovating all the way down to a, a blank slate, right down to dirt, and you're going to rebuild it. If you have an existing landscape out there, you're going to destroy it. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be perfectly honest with you. You're, you're going to tear it up in order to put it in. So we're going to determine where you're going to be doing the irrigation, where your water source is versus what your irrigating is going to be. And you're going to 
plan and think it out just a little bit. And I strongly suggest that you put something down on paper when you design these things out. It doesn't have to be some CAD drawing. It just has to be a sketch that somewhat accurately reflects what you have and then what you're irrigating and how. And it's nothing more than putting it on a piece of binder paper and plugging in where your valves should go according to where your water sources are and then spacing out your lawn areas as far as where would it make the most sense to have the irrigation heads, the spray heads. And then if you have plant material or a planting beds, determine if you're going to spray irrigate those. I would strongly suggest that you don't. I would suggest you go to a drip system and we'll talk about those here today as well. And then once you have it down on paper, just like an overall design, you're going to have a much better picture in your head of what the finished product is going to do. Okay. So determine your layout and what you're going to be irrigating. Is it the lawn? Then you're going to need spray heads and stuff that are going to do the job correctly. Is it a planting bed? Is it a, a veggie garden? Is it containers that you want to water? Whatever it is, you have to know where it is, what you're going to need to do to get to the end game and have a successful system that's going to provide that convenience for you. So to start off just with the basics today, in this case, we will discuss lawns first and then other applications in a few minutes. Irrigating a lawn system is a uh, very kind of rudimentary and it boils down to how big a lawn do you have and is this the finished lawn are you going to add to it are you going to whittle it down for some kind of landscape project reason but you have to know before you start throwing your time your effort and your dollars into it irrigating lawn areas is a combination of a few things and i want you to remember these because it becomes very critical as you put your system together those combination of things are coverage. Some of the biggest mistakes DIYers make is they space them too far out. They really do. They space the, the spray heads too far out. It says a 15 half head. And so they go, okay, well, I'm going to put them every 15 feet. We'll talk about that there in just a second. But coverage, we want to talk about overlap, a very key component in a successful irrigation system. We're going to talk about timing the system putting a timer into the system to help you automate it. We're going to talk about your individual environment and what, how it comes to bear on your system. And then we're going to talk about what water delivery devices are you going to choose. Okay. So those are some of the, just the little components of thinking this thing out. So if you go out to your lawn area, if you're really lucky for the newbie, you have a square, you have a rectangle, you have something very easy to determine what amount of square footage are you going to be watering? If you have a wandering bed line, curved bed lines for your lawn area, it makes it just slightly more difficult. But what I would say is kind of square them all up. You know, it, you may have a wandering bed line, but just square the thing out. Make a rectangle here, make a rectangle there, make a little square over here and cover all of your irregular shaped lawn area and determine your square footage. For the sense of simplicity, we're going to use a thousand square foot lawn area. Okay. And for that thousand square feet, we're going to determine kind of how many spray heads we're going to need. And as a result of how many spray heads we're going to need is going to determine how many valves we put in at the water source. Okay. So a thousand square feet. I usually used uh, what we call van spray heads. Van stands for variable angled nozzle. In other words, you could adjust the spray pattern of the nozzle by a simple twist of that nozzle. And you could make it a uh, quarter spray head. You can make it a half. You can make it a three quarters, or you could open that thing all the way up and it would be a full size head. They're really common from some of the big brands. And we're just going to use those as a way of taking care of those irregular shaped lawns. Okay. So we're going to use van heads in our hypothetical thousand square foot lawn. I always use the 15 
spray heads. Occasionally I would use the 18 van spray heads, depending on how much water pressure I had and some of the other math that you're going to hear about in a second. But here's where our coverage and overlap instantly comes into play. When you have a spray head that suggests it can do a 15 foot diameter, it is a suggestion at best. Take that as almost gospel. So I would like you to think that if you're going to use 15 foot spray heads, I want you to think 12 foot spacing. Instantly think three feet less. And if you have a prevailing breeze all the time, even in the, the critical hours of the early morning hours, maybe when you're going to be watering or in the early evening hours when you might be watering, then you might want to shrink it another foot or two to make sure that you have even better overlap and to combat the breeze or wind. And if you have a lot of wind, holy cow, you're going to be fighting an above ground spray head system. You really will be. But for right now, let's just focus in on 15 foot heads. We're going to put our little colored flags that you're going to get at the store every 12 feet. If you have a smaller lawn and you want to use 12 foot diameter spray heads, you're going to think nine. Are you picking up when I'm laying down here a little bit? So we have a throw pattern that is going to overlap each one by at least a foot or two. This is the big mistake that DIYers make. They space them too far apart. And there's one other mistake, and I'll tell you that in a minute. So you're going to go out there and at the edge of your lawn and maybe a few in the middle, depending on the size and the, depending on the layout, you're going to start spacing. Say you have picked up red flags, yellow flags, blue flags, and maybe a pink flag. I, I don't know whatever they had at the store, and you're going to start spacing. Now, are you going to put in 20 pink flags? No, you're not. And this is where we start thinking about math just a little bit. So we have put in a thousand square foot lawn system and we have spaced, let's hypothetically say you're going to need at least four individual watering zones out there based on the size of the plumbing that you have. Most homes, most residential builder development type of homes generally have three quarter inch or one inch plumbing that comes into the house. Most of the time, mm, some of them might have inch and a quarter, but they're generally bushed down to a smaller size by the time they enter the home. I've seen one inch as an average. The older homes, I mean old like me, probably galvanized pipe might have been one inch. I have seen larger stuff. I've seen inch and a quarter. I've seen even inch and a half, but then it always gets reduced down by the time it gets into the house. It's for ease of taking it off the city main lines and then stepping it down. For ease of installation, the larger main line systems that you have the easier your irrigation is going to be to design out. If you have a, uh, say, a, a quarter acre lot for your residential space and you've had, you have this thousand square foot lawn, if you can bring a one inch line to your valves and then service that thousand square foot with a one inch line, and then reduce it down for each individual head, you're going to have a very successful project and a very successful system that's going to take care of your landscaping needs easier than if you just have a three-quarter system. When you hear three-quarter, think more valves. When you hear one inch, think less valves. And if you're on rural property with a well and a pressure tank and all that, you can go inch and a half type of systems and then you have even less valves sometimes. But you rural people, you want to have bigger lawns and bigger planting beds and sometimes <laughs> inch and a half. I have used up to two inch for residential stuff, not two inch for small developed yards, city lots, that kind of stuff. But for rurals, I've put in two inch main lines, two inch valves, two inch laterals, and then stepped it down as we got further and further away from the valve system. These plumbing pipe sizes are going to be critical to how many valves you will use to take care of your thousand square foot lawn. I would generally say as a rule of thumb only that if you have a three quarter inch pipe that you're going to 
have to use because that's all you got. You got three quarter inch pipe. Remember these numbers and write them down just a little bit. A three quarter inch pipe system is going to average right around between nine and ten gallons per minute coming out of that pipe at an average of 50 pounds per square inch of pressure. Uh, that is the that's the gold standard, the average of an irrigation system off of a three quarter inch line. And that is nine to 10 gallons a minute at 50 PSI at the valves themselves. And the valves are relatively close to the house source. Spray heads now, here comes where the math is just a little bit. Spray heads, those 15 vans that I told you about, those heads, they generally average about 1.8 gallons per minute per head. And here's where the math is, okay? So for a newbie, a DIYer, like your math teacher told you in uh, junior high school, round up to the nearest even. So we're just gonna say, instead of 1.8, make it two gallons per minute. And instead of 9.34 gallons per minute coming out of the pipe, just round up to 10. So you can see that if you have two gallons per minute, then you're gonna need right around five heads per valve. Am I making myself clear there? So if you have your colored flags, go out there and place five red flags spaced out correctly, and then place five blue flags, and then five green flags, and then five pink flags if needed, and see how the spacing and the coverage is gonna be. And that's only if you're using half heads. If you went out there and said, well, I wanna put half heads vans around the perimeter, but then I need a couple of full heads in the middle so that the coverage is perfect. Now you're talking a full head that's gonna be throwing out almost three gallons a minute and it throws your whole math off because there's more gallons per minute coming out of that nozzle and robbing some of the gallons per minute from your valve. So if you plan on having a few full heads in some of the valves there, you may have to go over to an extra valve. So you may need five valves to do it instead of four. I hope I made myself clear there. It's basically uh, so much water is coming out of the pipe and that water is going through a valve and it's going to service only a certain amount of heads or you're not going to have any pressure at your heads to throw that water as far as it needs to be. So this is a formula that I've kind of used for years. It's a real basic formula. You figure three quarter, okay, I'm going to average right around five heads per valve. If you have a one inch pipe that's going to come out at 50 PSI, then you, you have a little more leeway. You have about 13 gallons per minute coming out. If you have higher pressures, then you may have just a little bit more than 13 gallons. If you have inch and a half pipe, now you've busted that thing way up to where you have almost 25, sometimes 27 gallons per minute. Now you've got a lot of heads to play with depending on the type of spray heads you use. But like I said, this is a formula that I've used for years and it's almost foolproof most of the time. Can you fudge it occasionally? Mm, sometimes maybe. You might get away with six heads on there on a three-quarter system. If you're watering at a time of day that no one's using any water in the house, say like it five o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night. Everybody's done with dishwashers and showers and any other water use in the house. Yeah, you might be able to get away with one. If you have very high pressured water systems, say like you have, I have seen up to 90 PSI coming out of some people's houses, uh, which I think is just ludicrous, but I have seen it. And you have to make sure that when you're putting your system together, you make sure all your joints are absolutely glued perfect at 90 PSI. I have seen good performance, the best performance at right around 65, 60 to 65 at the top end of static water pressure. If you're on a well system and your pressure switch allows for 60, 40 on your pressure tank, then make it 60, 40. When we bought uh, Brook and Pond here, and I looked at the pressure switch on our well. It's a 60-40, but they had it literally at like 38-25, and it was just horrible water pressure in the house. And so I adjusted it. I adjusted the, the upper end up to 60 and the lower end at 40. And it's night and day. Night and day in the shower, 
and it will be night and day outside as well. Okay, so let's review. Up to this point, we have talked about layout and what you're going to be watering. We have determined the amount of water that comes out of your existing plumbing system. We have determined that certain spray heads put out a certain amount of water per minute. And you've been taught how to figure, okay, if I have a three quarter system, it's going to put out about nine to 10 gallons a minute. And then my heads are throwing out around two gallons per minute. So I can have about five at the most, maybe six heads per valve. All right, are we clear on that? So back to our hypothetical lawn. If you have a thousand square foot lawn that you're gonna be irrigating, you've placed your colored flags accordingly to indicate individual heads and how many heads are going to be per valve. Each valve is coordinated with a particular colored flag. Maybe four valves with five heads per valve. That's gonna be kind of an average. That's 20 spray heads that you're gonna have out in that area to make sure it waters correctly. So this is one way, the easiest way to water that thousand square feet. Another way would be using different types of spray heads, like impact heads, like the old canister rainbird impact heads. But more advanced things are the rotor heads that are out there now, the gear driven rotor heads. These devices use various nozzles as well that deliver another certain amount of gallons per minute coming out of each nozzle. Usually with these bigger heads, you're talking somewhere between three to five gallons per minute. Now you can see how the heads per valves would change quite a bit. You might have a three quarter system, three quarter plumbing, and you have something that's putting out five gallons a minute. You're really only gonna be able to service two heads off of each valve. Now you can step down those nozzles, those insertable nozzles to where maybe you have three now maybe you can have three canister or three rotor heads per valve off your three quarter system. If you have a one inch system, okay, then maybe you have three, maybe four, depending on which size nozzle you're gonna choose. And that nozzle, that just means that those nozzles are gonna throw less water or more water, depending on what you put in there. If you have a bigger system, an inch and a half pipe or more, you can use larger nozzles that are gonna throw more water, which is gonna cover, provided that you have the pressure to adequately handle those bigger nozzles. And you've kind of looked at, geez, my water source is near my front door and I'm watering all the way in the backyard. Now the run of that main pressurized lateral line that goes back to service those heads, now you've got like 75, 80 feet, maybe even 100 feet by the time the last head gets that water. And you're gonna run across another component of this that I'm gonna tell you here in just a second that can affect the performance of the whole system. So usually upsizing the heads to these canisters or these rotors, you have to put in some thought process of can I upsize the pressurized piping that's gonna service this. Maybe you have a one inch pipe going into your house, but you have an inch and a half coming into your property out at your water meter or wherever it comes into your property it's very very easy you can do it yourself by shutting off at the system out at your street where your water meter might be you can shut it off dig down cut into that water main put in a T and your system now might be inch and a half for a small residential yard when I was contracting rotor heads were kind of the standard that I used 90% of the time. Spray heads were the other 10%, depending on the size of the lawn that I was installing or coming back and retrofitting things in an existing landscape. Most of them never had inch and a half pipe. I generally ran kind of right around the three quarter and the one inch pipe stuff. When I did rural yards, it was the, the gold standard was always inch and a half pipe. So I knew just walking in and giving estimates for folks, I would go right to the water source and I would say, okay, they have a three quarter system. Okay, they have a one inch system. Okay, they have an inch and a half coming from the well and going to the house. Then I knew just based on experience, how to estimate parts and pieces and the system and the job itself based off almost solely off of what the size of the plumbing 
that uh, was present. I would also take a pressure tester, something that you screw on a hose bib, turn it on, and you, you saw how much pressure there was. So by the time I left this potential job site, I knew what the plumbing size was, I knew how big an area we were talking about the project being, and I knew what the PSI, or the pounds per square inch, of the system that they had. And did I need to adjust it if I could, if it was like off a well system, or was it adequate the way it was? So just briefly again, you can tap in to your, your main water system before the house, which is gonna give you uh, top-notch pressure, possibly a bigger pipe, rather than what you're gonna have to take off of your house, and to be able to service a system with maybe inch and a quarter or inch and a half pipe, then you can step it down and use whatever size pipe you need for your irrigation system and almost like overcompensating for it. It's gonna be the perfect system, it really will. Many times, older homes, I always had to take the system and develop it right off of the hose bib where the water faucet was in the front yard or the backyard. And I would just spin off that, that water faucet, put on a galvanized T, threaded T, put it back on the house plumbing, put my water faucet back on, and then that T, that drop down, that was gonna be my, my sprinkler system. And it worked really well. I really had to pay attention to what size I had. I mean, if you have half inch copper coming to the, the house wall, and then now you're gonna to try to run rotor heads and all this other stuff, you're gonna have an underperforming system for sure. And that's where it pays to go out and see if you could put something on the water main pipe that comes into the property. So with these upgraded rotor impact heads, the same uh, line of thinking still applies. You may have a rotor head that is advertised to take 25 foot diameter coverage. Well, instead of thinking 25, we're going to think 20 or even 18. For me, I saw the standard Rainbird 3504 rotor head that advertises 25 foot of coverage. I thought 18 right away. That way you would have at least three feet of overlap and very good system in the end, plain and simple. So a little uh, standard, I should say, if I was playing with a one inch line system on these rotor heads, I would have no more than four heads per valve. On an inch and a half system, it was generally six to seven heads per valve. At Weed Patch Ranch, when we lived there, it always averaged six to seven. And those were the, the Rainbird 3504s. That's the standard ones. You can find those at the box stores. You can find them almost everywhere. Did I use the super fancy stainless steel brass tops rotor heads? No, I did not. Remember, I was running a business and I had to make sure that uh, my price point and my quality of components got me the job without going blasting over budget. I mean, if someone was coming in on a $5,000 job and I was coming in at 8,200 and they go, why are you so expensive? Well, I'm using these fancy stainless steel, you know, I, that's just not good business practice. It's really not. Now, if I had a uh, architectural plan that I was estimating off of and that plan called for those things, I always did the customer, I went the extra step. I would say, well, here's how much it's gonna be if you use what's designed here. They want the fancy fancies, but here's also how much it's gonna cost if we do just the standard. They're gonna perform the same. They're still gonna throw the same amount of water. They're just not super fancy fancy. So keep it in mind. You can still accomplish everything you need to accomplish without busting the bank. All right, here's another thing, I, and I promised it a few minutes ago. I wanna cover a, uh, an element of hydraulics that you have to be aware of, and that is the element of what they call friction loss. Much like voltage drop in landscape lighting, friction loss in plumbing and water is a real thing. You could have at your valves, coming right out of the house area there, you might have 60 PSI. But as that water travels through your plumbing, and it makes left turns and right turns through elbows and T's and whatever. And by the time that weight of water, all that pipe is filled with water and it's being pushed by pressure, there's a component called friction loss. And your last head 
in that valve system might not be 60 PSI. It might be 32 PSI. Is it enough? Yes, usually. But here's another DIY failure that I had seen quite a bit, and that is too many heads per valve. I've kind of taught you that, you know, five to six on a three quarter system per valve. Uh, one inch system, you could get away with six to seven. These are talking about spray heads now. But if you have a long distance that you have to travel that water to your irrigation heads, consider dropping one, one head per valve to compensate for the amount of friction loss that goes into this pipe and how far of distance and travel not to even address if you have to push water uphill to something. Elevation loss and friction loss, you can, you, you can lose half of the pressure depending on how big a pipe, how steep a hill, how long of distance, okay? So friction loss is a real thing. How do you combat friction loss? You can combat it a little bit. You can have the least amount of turns in your pipe, the least amount of T's and L's if you can do just a straight shot from valve to heads, the better. You can step your pipe down so that you have a one inch pipe that comes out of the valves that goes to your first head or two, and then you push the next part of the system down to three quarter for your next head or two, and then your last heads, you've bushed it down to a half inch pipe. So you compensate for that distance loss by stepping down the pipe so you increase the PSI and you keep the last couple of heads on a half inch pipe and it kind of evens things out a little bit. So keep in mind friction loss when it comes to a long distance of plumbing between your source and that last head. And again, this is where people put in their own systems and they turn the system on and it works, but the last couple heads are kind of going eh, eh, they're, they're struggling to, to do it or it works, but they didn't space it out correctly. So this little area of lawn over here isn't getting very good coverage. So they just instantly think, well, I'm just gonna put in another head or two. And that's where the whole valve system collapses and you, you're going, what did I do wrong? Why isn't this thing working correctly? And that's when, that's when Coach's phone would ring. All right, so friction loss. So before we go on to the next part of this, let's talk about parts and some of the nomenclature that goes along with it. When it comes to your plumbing pipe, you're going to, if you're running PVC pipe, the white pipe, you're gonna think of only two different kinds. Schedule 40, which is the thicker walled pipe, that is always gonna be your gold standard for your uh, pressurized lines. Now, many people put in Schedule 40 all the way through their whole system, you know, that, and there's nothing wrong with that. For me, I use Schedule 40 on all constant pressurized lines up to and before the valve assembly system. Schedule 40 can generally go up to about 400 PSI bursting strength, and it is the standard, the industry standard that is used for PVC. And then for your pipe that is out in the yard, the ones that are actually servicing spray heads, we call that lateral piping, CL200. CL200 is the, the PVC standard for laterals. You may also hear about poly pipe, polyethylene pipe, black pipe. Polyethylene pipe is kind of the standard not PVC. Uh, when I did a job in Idaho, it was all pretty much, it was all polyethylene pipe because it is much more forgiving and can actually, it's not as rigid as PVC. So in colder climates, if you've forgotten to winterize, it will be a little more forgiving. It will still burst, but it'll get you through that first hard freeze and you go, oh shoot, I forgot to winterize and you'll be okay most of the time. Okay, we're talking about valves. We're talking about anti-siphon valves. Anti-siphon valves are generally above ground anti-siphon. It prevents water that once it goes out to the system, it cannot flow back into your potable house system. Then there's the inline valves. Inline valves are underground, generally in a box, but not always. And inline valves are generally in conjunction with a vacuum breaker or a double check valve that again doesn't allow water to go from your irrigation system back into your potable house system. So valves, remember anti-siphons or inlines. Connectors. Connectors are the things that are going to turn the piping system to go into a certain direction. 
you're going to have L's, T's, couplers, bushings, bushings that uh, change the size of the pipe. You may have an inch and a half pipe, and you are going to use a bushing, a reducer bushing, to take it from inch and a half down to one inch, or one inch down to three quarter. And then there's adapters, uh, threaded adapters, usually for valve assembly. And within some of these parts and pieces, you may have L's and T's that have three quarter or one inch slip, in other words, gluable connectors. And then you'll have a smaller threaded part of that component that you're going to screw in uh, swing arms and other things that will actually connect to your heads themselves. Okay. And lastly, components wise, you're going to have glue, PVC glue. Uh, you might have compression fittings for polyethylene pipe. You might have primer that goes along with the glue, Teflon tape that go on to male threaded parts of your adapters, and also scheduling nipples and other parts and pieces that actually thread in to your spray heads themselves. So a little component nomenclature there. So let's talk about uh, our next chapter, and that is shrub and plant areas, not the lawn areas. Here's, here's the neat thing about it. If you are going to water your shrub and planting bed areas with spray heads, the same application, the same thought process goes into it. If you're using spray heads, you're either going to have pop-up spray heads, or you're going to have uh, spray heads called shrub heads that go on top of risers so they can actually spray over your plant material and cover the area nicely. But still, valves, number of heads per valve, all that is still the same. It really is. So that makes it kind of easy to transition, right? If you're thinking about your system and you've got a perimeter fence line that you're doing, you've spaced out your heads just like you did the lawn. So how many other valves are you going to need to water your backyard fence line? Now, in this day and age, in many places of the country, especially western U.S. and some other parts of the world that are always drought stricken, spray heads in planter beds are kind of a thing of the past. Drip systems are the standard, the industry standard nowadays. Uh, this type of system goes from gallons per minute at a spray head to gallons per hour at a small emitter. And depending on the type of system that you choose, you could have systems that water on individual emitters, or you might have a ground laid system that has a very fancy almost like a uh, soaker hose type of system that is put out by uh, companies like Netafim and Rainbird. They have drip hoses that you actually snake through your planter beds. And the hose has slices like every nine inches or so that emit a small amount of water and drip that way. So when you're talking about drip systems now, some other thoughts have to come to bear on it. Pressure now is or can be your enemy. If you have 60 PSI and now you're going to be designing out and installing a drip system for your beds, you can't use 60 PSI on many of the drip plumbing components. You'll end up blowing connections apart and end up with problems of flooding and other things. So you have to address the pressure of it by putting on pressure regulators right at the valve. And that is the downstream part of the valve, not before the valve. And what I used to do is they have devices that you can buy. They come from Rainbird, uh, Agrifim, uh, other companies that have not only filtration, but also pressure reduction right in one simple device that you just screw in to the downstream part of the valve, and you're done. Maybe it'll take your 60 PSI, and it'll reduce it down to 30 PSI, which is a much more safer, or even 25 PSI, because you don't need that pressure. You just need a certain amount of gallons per minute going out, and even that becomes very forgivable. Now, when it comes to the drip systems, I'm going to give you the basics, and I'm going to tell you everything you need to know 
on a functioning system. But I'm not going to tell you everything that I know about drip systems. It's, it's going to make this way too long. But consider this. There's a couple of options. When you come off your valve or valves that are going to service your planting beds, there's a couple ways you can approach it. You can have your pressure reduction and your filtration right at the valve, or you can take it from the valve with just your regular plumbing and go to the planting bed itself. And then in a small box, you can connect your filtration and pressure reduction out there. So you take as much of your flow as possible out to the planting bed. And then in a small six inch valve box, you can put a remote filtration and pressure reduction. I hope I made that clear. And what is the application for a remote one? A bigger yard, basically. A bigger yard. And you're taking your PVC or your polyethylene pipe and you're running it out there to get as much gallons per minute and everything on a longer distance. And then you're going to a drip system out there. And you're still making it accessible. You put it in a protective box. It's underground. And then from your filter backflow preventer, all the other things that go along with that little device. Then you take off with your half inch or maybe your three quarter inch drip supply line and go to your heads and go to your emitters and each individual plant, etc. Are they a little more time consuming? Yes, they are. Uh, are you on your hands and knees a lot more? Yes, you are. But your coverage and your water conservation and your water delivery is so precise, you're not wasting it. And so many cities and counties and states are now requiring this. And they actually uh, help you by not having you to adhere to certain water days because you have drip systems. That was, that was what I had uh, where I was practicing. If you had a drip system, if you had a lawnless landscape, one that did not have turf, you could water whenever you wanted because the amount of water that you were using was a tenth of what a spray system was, plain and simple. So you snake your supply line in and around your planter beds and off of that supply line that you basically staple down to the ground, you put in little connectors and then you have even smaller pipe that goes to each individual plant. And we'll cover nomenclature here in just a second. Now, depending on the size of the plant itself, will determine how many emitters that plant is going to have. For instance, if it's a brand new landscape, a one gallon plant initially would require one emitter. A five gallon plant, two emitters. A 15 gallon tree, three emitters. A 24 inch box specimen plant tree would get five emitters. So you can see that if you have a very expensive planter bed with big trees and everything because you want insta landscape, you're going to need quite a few emitters to take care of that system and most likely a three quarter inch black polyethylene supply line to give you that much. So as far as nomenclatures, nomenclatures are valves, same valves that we talked about on turf application. We have supply lines. Those are the lines that are actually going to be feeding your drip system. And 95% of the time, they're either going to be a half inch supply line or a three quarter inch supply line. Then you have emitter tubing. Emitter tubing is generally quarter inch emitter tubing. It comes in a coil. It's flexible, at least if it's warm out and that goes to your individual plant. And then emitters. Emitters are the actual water delivering device that's going to take care of your individual plant. But coach, what if I want to have a, a planter bed, but in the front of the planter bed, I want to plant annuals and have pretty flowers and stuff there. Or I have a small area of ground cover that I want to cover. You can't drip individual ground covers. You're right. So then they have things called microsprays. Microsprays are just water delivering devices that use a tenth of the water, but they spray just like a spray head. 
and they generally come on a stake that you screw the individual spray head on and that way you end up with your ground cover areas or your annual bed being able to be covered. Okay, so let's talk about the nomenclature on drip system. Valves are exactly the same thing. Supply lines, usually half inch or three quarter inch black poly tubing. Emitter tubing is the quarter inch flexible tubing that you are going to stake at each individual plant. The emitter is the actual water delivering device that is generally rated in gallons per hour. Connectors, you're going to have push couplings most of the time. Couplers, L's, T's, and they're either going to be quarter inch, half inch, or three quarter inch. Ground stakes for your supply line. Emitter stakes for each individual plant. Now you can go to the box stores and you can see, well it's not just box stores, box stores, hardware stores, uh, specialty landscape irrigation stores, and you can ask to see all of these individual things. So vision, vision and hearing and application makes understanding so much easier. Don't just take this podcast and go, oh, well now I can do it. Go down there with a cup of coffee and walk the irrigation aisles and learn what each individual is. That way you know how many you're going to need, how much is it going to cost, how many you're going to need for all the whole landscape that you're doing. Let's move on. Wrap it up. Environmental factors. These are basic microclimate considerations that are applicable to your individual location. Some of these can be, are you in a very arid climate? Maybe you're in the desert southwest. You're in the Central Valley of California. Uh, you're in uh, New Mexico, Arizona, very, very dry conditions. Or are you in very humid conditions? The Southeast, the Midwest during summer. This all comes to bear on how much water you're going to need to put on your landscape. Another one is prevailing winds. Are you in an area that is constantly breezy and windy? And is that going to affect your pop-up spray heads or your rotor heads for your lawn or your planting beds? It does no landscape any good if you have a 20 mile an hour wind every afternoon that your pop-up spray heads that come on at 5 o'clock in the evening are going to come out of the nozzle and hang right because there's too much wind. So the time of day that you're going to have to water is much different than if you have basically no wind in your location. Pop-up spray heads, you can water almost any time. However, I would say early mornings and early evenings are the best time. The other thing is, is your plant or lawn varieties that you're actually using will also determine how much water you're going to need to put on that lawn or on those plants. You may have a planting bed filled with succulents and cactus and you may only need to water maybe, maybe three times during the summertime to keep things as nice as possible. You may have a particular types of plants and ground covers that require water daily because of the next thing. Maybe what kind of soils are you currently having at your home? The soil porosity, say clay versus sandy, is going to require a total different amount of water in order to uh, accommodate the plant varieties that you're going to use. And then finally, shade versus full sun and temperature changes between the seasons. Where I used to practice, we'd have a 92 degree day was the average summer temperatures. Where, where I'm at now, an average summer day, a full sun day, is maybe 72. A ah, super hot day where I live now is 85. That's like a freaking heat wave. And yet where I used to live, Central Valley of Northern California, an 85 degree summer day was like, woohoo, cool day today. And then there's other parts of the country and world where upper 90s and 100s are the norm for summer temperatures and are obviously going to require a different approach as far as how much water you put out. The other little factors is what are your regulations when it comes to watering? Know those before you design your system. If you have water on and water off days, know that you're going to have to make sure you have plant material that can tolerate three times a week of watering versus needing water every day. 
And there really shouldn't be, uh, let me just throw this out there, there really shouldn't be landscapes going in that can't survive on three times a week watering, even in the heat of the summer. Um, select your plant material th so that it can be accommodated with three times a week. If something needs water every single day, there's something wrong with your system, wrong with the plant, or wrong with the placement of the plant. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about timing for just a second. The days of manual operation are kind of a thing of the past. Automatic electrical operation is the, thing, the gold standard for what is out there nowadays. In this day and age with technology at our disposal, I don't really know why someone would want to not automate an irrigation system. And if you can think of one, hey, let me know, please. I guess you could rationalize a, a veggie garden system to be manual, but even that can be automated to, to water correctly. Automation just kind of allows a sense of flexibility, uh, certainly a sense of precision, certainly a sense of water delivery in multiple applications, and certainly multiple applications at a certain time frame depending on season, depending on weather. It also allows you for system turnoff, should you get an early rainstorm for some reason, or you have rain arriving the next day, and as soon as it starts, you have a rain sensing device on your system, just shuts the system off. In contrast, a manual system has to be monitored. You have to go out there and turn it on, go back into your life and do whatever, and then remember to turn it off minutes later, so you're not running water down the street, they're not even allowed. Where I used to practice, you couldn't have manual systems. You have to have automated systems. So if you're going to invest the money into an irrigation system, make sure that you put a timer on it. It's very, very important. Here's another example of automated benefit, and that is, what if you go on vacation? Are you going to pay the little Billy down the street to come turn on the hose and water your lawn? Or come over there with the little metal key and turn on each valve while he sits there and cleans his fingernails or picks his nose or whatever and waters each, each zone manually? Come on. It's super simple to put a timer in. Weekend getaways during the summertime. Nobody's there to water. Timers are the basic electric device that is the brains behind an automated irrigation system. They are electric. You plug them into the wall. You can use various timer devices that are battery only, but I don't suggest them. Batteries basically fail after a while. And they'll fail when you least need them to fail on that one week vacation that you're going up to the lake. And it's 105 back at your house. And you didn't change the batteries when you changed your smoke detector battery. And now that's when it doesn't turn on and you come back to a brown lawn. So electric timers, you plug into the wall, you run a small wire that has even smaller wires out to where your valves are at. You wire up your valves, you wire up the, the wire to your timer, and you set your timer. And I'm, do, I'm doing this very, very rudimentary, I really am. But uh, then you set them for what day of the week you're going to water, what time of day, and how many minutes per zone are you going to water. Remember, your, your lawn heads are going to require less minutes of watering than your drip system. You're not going to want to turn on your planting bed for just five minutes, like one of your lawn zones might be. You're going to want to turn those on for maybe a half hour, depending on what your, again, what your, your individual landscape needs are going to require, plain and simple. And nowadays, your timer can be programmed and even connected to Wi-Fi if you have it at your house and to your smartphone you can put an app on it and now you can change you can change your watering system from one side of the country or world just by connecting into it turn your timer on when you're vacationing in the Swiss Alps and you can turn it on in San Diego because it's going to be a little hotter that day so you can change the, the amount of time I cannot think of one landscape project that I've done, either when I was a part-timer, a full-timer, a contractor, anything, over the past 40 years where I didn't have a timer that went on the system. It's just, it's ludicrous not to put something like that on. 
Okay, let's end this, shall we? I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say some folks might say that this lesson was too long. It was too much. Others will leave wanting more information because of their individual needs. To this I say, hey, if you have more questions, email me. If it is too long, tell me why and how would I have adjusted this lesson in order to accommodate as many individual components and ways of installation. I, as a teacher, you have to be complete. You can't be incomplete for the sake of a troll that wants an answer. Right now, I want to know exactly how to put it in, and I want to know exactly how it's going to be perfect, but I want you to teach me in five minutes, which is really common nowadays. Everybody's instant gratification meter is generally always pegged all the way in the red. Well, I say this to you. I will never be incomplete or without detail. It's just not who I am. And if this was too long, heh, sorry, I, I don't know what to tell you. You got everything you need to know to do it. You didn't get everything that I know, but you got everything you need to know. Because if I gave you everything I do know, this would be a five-hour lesson. I found that it's really hard to please everybody all the time. I stopped trying to do that many years ago. This is just a basic introduction. There are many other little facets and tricks and tips, but this will definitely get you started and completed with a very functioning system. Lastly, remember these key facets of irrigation installation. One, area to be covered. Two, the plumbing size available for your irrigation system. Three, the number of heads needed to properly cover the area to be watered. Four, the number of valves to properly provide to a certain number of those heads. Remember your turf versus shrubs versus drip system and how they differ a little bit. Number six, pressure loss and what causes it and how can you compensate for it. Seven, timers and the automation of an irrigation system. Eight, don't forget your spacing and your overlap element of installation. Nine, marking out the area using colored flags. Each color represents the valve that's going to serve that colored flag. Each color represents that valve. Ten, the type of plumbing available and the size needed to do it right. Eleven, winter considerations. And don't forget to blow the system out in the fall to maintain longevity and avoid cracking pipes, cracking valves, cracking backflow preventers, etc. And finally, 12, the maintenance of your system. Remember to clean out your nozzles occasionally, depending on the type of water you have. If you have a lot of calcium carbonate in your water, you may have to check the nozzles periodically and clean them out, blow them out, and then put them back together. If nozzles get hit with string trimmers or mowers, Make sure you fix them because they're certainly not going to be working correctly after a little while, if not instantly. And then finally, if you have questions regarding this, you should be writing. You should be talking to a professional locally. You should be talking to uh, me if you want to. And don't forget that all of this is expanded on in my book and also in my digital course. And you can see that on the website, youryardcoach.com. All right, this was a biggie. But hey, I'm trying to get you ready for your landscape projects that some of you, or if not a lot of you, are going to be having this year. And hey, go back and listen to it again if you want to learn it some more, take some more notes, whatever. Hey, I'm Coach. I hope that you got something from this. Tell somebody who may be uh, in your circle of influence, if they're doing it, maybe they want to listen to it as well. And as always, to your guys' landscape success. I will see you guys next week. I appreciate your time and your attention. Any questions, you can email me at youryardcoach at gmail.com if we want to go to another step of understanding. Take care, guys. Bye for now. Hey, friends. Maestro here. Just dropping a reminder to check out the podcast description for discount opportunities and any important links. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on a specific app, please don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps us grow and continue to provide these free podcasts. Again, thanks for listening to this week's show, and we'll see you right here next week.